68 cities took part all over the globe. They had more than 17,000 people participating, 441,000 observations made of 86 cities. You are listening to Welcome back to another episode of the Herbal Wildlife Podcast. This is one of your co-hosts, Billy Brown, with Tony Crosdale. It's been a little while. We did that series of episodes about wildlife um, rescue and rehab, and that took a lot of time and energy and took a little out of us. <laughs> so I think we were kind of like, we're going to work on some other stuff in the meantime. And uh, before I get too far, I want to actually. I'll say we've had some great activity on the Patreon account. We need to thank Adam Jack and Sandy Brubaker, both for recent contributions. I'm moving, so the Urban Wildlife Podcast will have a studio. He's moving to a different neighborhood in Philadelphia, don't worry. Yeah, yeah I'm moving to um, a na- uh, neighborhood called Roxborough in-, in Philadelphia, and I'll be actually next two houses down from the, an entrance to the Wissahickon Park, a 1,900-acre urban forest. Uh, with barred owls and pileated woodpeckers and red salamanders and and milk snakes. Yeah, it's it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, a bear showed up there not that long ago, and, and the bears moving there in a couple of weeks. Indeed, <laughs> and I have a a man cave, um, and that's where the studio will be. So uh, I'm buying a new recorder, I'm buying a new computer, and I'm getting some some mics. So we're gonna up our audio game considerably. Awesome. And if you want to be part of that too, you can uh, give us a little contribution at www.patreon.com slash urbanwildlifecast. I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of reviews we got. One is from a woman named Mary uh, who said, Hey, I'm new to your podcast and have really enjoyed the shows, but your intro music is loud, jarring, and annoying. <laughs> I think this is mostly a generational thing, but I'll meet you halfway. And so I wrote Mary back and said, hey, sorry we can't agree on the music, but I'm glad you're liking the show. Yeah. So, and, you know, if you are if you have friends who are like, I don't know about the music, just tell them to skip 30 seconds into each episode and you'll skip the music. You'll live. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we got a great note from Doug Sponsler, who is both a listener as well as one of our favorite guests uh, slash subjects recently. Um, and he said he just wanted to drop a note to say that the wildlife rehab episodes you posted recently were amazing. Um, what is most haunting is the moral zeal of the people you profiled and the uncanny commonality that was evident among them, even if they came from different backgrounds and live on opposite sides of the world. The wildlife rehab community gives me the impression, if you'll forgive a hasty metaphor, of a sort of monastic order. Its work goes largely unnoticed but serves in a unique and irreplaceable way to preserve our humanity through the exercise of mercy against technocratic cruelty. It was sort of a beautiful way of highlighting something that I think we were seeing in common with a lot of uh, the people we were talking to in those episodes. And we will exercise, mer- even though we would never exercise anything but mercy, um, on the house centipede that just crawled past my head. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little guy. <laughs> um, I do love house centipedes. I do. Um, I'm fr- I like know, sharing with them. You know, you say that, but one of my favorite bug stories was when Magnolia was a baby and we would take baths together. She was like, a, I don't know, one or something like that, or one, but maybe two, I don't know, toddler. Um, and we're in the bathtub, getting clean, and then um, a decent-sized house centipede crawls out of, like, the overflow drain on the bathtub yeah. and lands in the water. And my girl, to her credit, did not freak out. She was like, oh, we got to save it. <laughs> she was like, say it. She had the vocabulary to say it, but, like, she was desperate to save that bug. And I convinced her not to use her hands because we didn't want to smush it. Um, but we scooped it out of there, left it on the windowsill um, so it could dry out and run away. Oh, and um, I have a new addition to the family, Shamu. Shamu. Shamu is uh, a tuxedo cat hey. that I um, took in. It was uh, most likely abandoned in my park. and Okay. Um, cats are abandoned regularly. Because this keeps happening. Yeah, and in fact, I actually got on video... This is something I, I wouldn't be appropriate to share, you know. Um, it'd be amazing to show, but I mean, it's for my work security camera. I think it's legal issues, and um, I might we'll get f- fired. But I have a video of a of two guys pulling up in a Subaru of all cars, 
uh, the car, you know, the, the car of environmental responsibility, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, of environmental, uh, big minded people, and they... It wasn't uh, a Hummer, is what you're saying. <laughs> right. And they, uh, you know, but it's stereotypical that birders and herpers all love Subarus. Yeah. And so they uh, pull up, they put a cat carrier in our trash, and then they leave, and the way that it was positioned, you couldn't see what was happening out the out the back gate of the of their, um, their tailgate, and they pull away, and there's uh, an orange tabby in a and a tuxedo cat and they just look bewildered and then the orange tabby runs towards the center of the cat runs into the woods i mean the tuxedo runs into the woods and then when i arrived um the door i, I go to open the door for work today and i hear Row! and i look down as a pathetic little orange tabby that um my friend my wife's really good friend one of her bridesmaids actually adopted it turns out it was chipped they didn't want it back and then under the circumstances that i got it videotaped they're not going to they're not going to give it back anyway. I called the... the. They dumped a chipped cat? Yeah. And I actually called the yeah. the, the you know, Humane Society law enforcement. And they never called me back. Because I said, I got video. We can do something about this. Um, but they uh, she took it in. It was a 13-year-old cat. It's really sweet. It's doing really well. Uh, she, 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 she got all fixed up. And the tuxedo has been... It's been like two, three weeks now. And um, I saw it. I had to come back. After going to see, I ordered tickets so i can go see bohemian rhapsody and i left my card at the work so i came back after the movie to get my card and i see the tuxedo cat outside and just yet just today we're getting a um cable internet installed at the facility believe it or not i've been using for a year and a half and using dsl yeah, I know. and i uh go out back to let the guy downstairs to the um phone lines and i come back and i hear Row! and there's a tuxedo cat under like some plywood and it wouldn't let me approach it which i shouldn't do anyway because these things could very likely i mean there's number two rabies, rabies the number two rabies yeah. vector in a state but you know it's not ready to be approached yet so what's you know i hate to say it, what usually happens is these things um get hungry enough and eventually they'll, they'll start hanging out by the front door i'll get it into a box and get it adopted take it to a shelter but what's interesting is this cat is like very similar size and shape to my cat, it's, my cat's quite large, and this cat's quite large too. Wait, and where'd you get your cat? So my cat's a different story. Oh. Um, two weeks, uh, uh, two days before these two cats were dumped, I uh, and mind you, only um, a couple days after we got another tabby cat, a gray tabby cat adopted that was hanging out in the center. I come in. I have a thing for tuxedos. Yeah. I said the next cat I want to get was a tuxedo, but you know, obviously I'm not going to buy a cat, right? Yeah. I come in to. Uh, work and i hear Rah! like it's like like ah! that kind of a yeah and i and i see this uh giant you know uh tuxedo cat walk up and i'm like all right and it lets me pet it and like hmm and then i let it in the building and it jumps right up to my lap and like snuggles against my neck and i'm like all right so i i didn't take <laughs> it home that night <laughs> and i showed pictures of it to my wife and angie was like should we adopt it and so we went over the next day to get it, and, and he, it stayed, you know, in the center the whole day. But I had to put it back out because I can't, you know, leave it in the building unattended. And so we came back that night to get it, and we couldn't get it in a carrier because the carrier is too small. <laughs> so she said, why don't you just pick it up? And I picked it up, and we drove home, and Eddie drove, and the cat was just snuggling on, on my neck, purring the whole time. This cat is amazing. It is so sweet. It just, it just you know, she, we watched a movie, Angie would be on the couch, I'll be on the easy chair and a cat will just jump on my lap for like half an hour then jump snuggle up next to her back and forth and in in the in our bed it, it goes from you know in between us to on her to on me it's so likes us equally that, what happened to the other tuxedo cat it's still it's still I'm at, still trying to grab it this is the cat that was in the video right i know yeah. this it's not my cat my cat was already i already had it before his dog but and i could tell because it has like a white muzzle just like the one in the video. So my, what I'm assuming is this cat's just going to start starving. And come to the door. And Because and, my theory is that, like, straight-up feral cats, they're not going to come to the door. But I think that people dump pets, and they they associate people with food. Once you know, once the hunger gets the better of their shyness, they'll make themselves known. Like, my cat is so friendly. It was probably, like, immediately dumped. It's like, where's people? As much as, well, first thought is... is People who might get in debates with Tony about cats should will be able to tell from this discussion the dude's a cat lover. You love cats. I love cats. They're great pets. And then the other part is that as much as we res we get mad 
and I think we'll keep getting mad, at the big-hearted but misguided people who feed cats outside and do things like trap, neuter, and then re-abandon them, we should start by getting pissed off at the people who dump their cats. <laughs> absolutely. Well, absolutely. That's where it starts. But, you know, we need to talk. Like, I made a post uh, um, uh, recently announcing that I have this cat, and I said, I because this cat is cute and cuddly, I decided to yeah. artificially <laughs> lengthen its life by killing you know, domestic animals and fish to, to you know, to feed it. Yeah. And then we need to be honest about that. Like, when you say you rescue an animal, you're condemning all the other animals that have to be killed to feed it. It's an act of speciesism. To yeah. Terms and, of and like, folks. and my thing is, my point by, by driving that home is the, one of the drivers behind the invasive species lobby is that these pets are, are, you know, the, these spe- the cats and dogs, but dogs don't really have a feral problem, at least in America. Yeah. But we can't let the fact that we've chosen a few animals as our companions dictate environmental policy. Yeah. Dictate land management, wildlife management. Yeah. You know, and, and we have to drive home the fact that these things kill or we have to kill to keep them alive. And there's environmental implications. There's, there's animal rights implications. Yeah. And, you know, if you do the math... You know, if you if you euthanize a predatory animal, you save the lives of hundreds of thousands of animals. Yeah. And we need we need to just not let uh, the emotions get the better of us when yeah. making these decisions. And this hard line that you can't kill is is just nonsense because yeah. you are killing to keep these things alive. No, there is no there is no such thing as a no kill solution. Yeah, and in yeah. Philly, our main shelter is going no kill. The new director announced that as the goal. And so I was looking at that article again and trying to like be be careful. It, it, it wasn't that they were announcing a big policy shift, but more the intention. And it still sucks. Well, why call you know when this um when this um, I wrote my council person. Yeah. I think you probably wrote you, you made a call or two about it. Yeah, and this so this orange cat that showed up right my and uh, Yasmin took it. You know, to her credit, and a lovely person. Um, but this uh when a cat before she took it, I was trying to figure out what to do with it. I made a call. And to another animal shelter, and they're like, "No, we're full." And I'm like, so that means some like, Great. some some like, and they're full. They're full. So they take. So what gets me mad about that is that means they're full of cats that very well might not be adoptable, right? Because frankly, there's probably some cats that have been there a really long time. And here's a cat that's super cuddly and friendly. Yeah. And yeah, it's old, but like you know, you would It's it was a very adoptable cat. Yeah. And yeah, it's adorable. It's really affectionate, and like it's doing really well. Be like, I don't know what to do. I don't. Know, or I just someone be like, I don't, I'm moving next week. I don't have the time to do this. Like, I'm just gonna dump it in the park. And you're just yeah. you're you know you're just pushing the problem off to other. Yeah. In in in, in my case, it's a public park. The wildlife live in this park is public property essentially. It's a public resource to yeah. be enjoyed by everybody, and it's being diminished. Yeah. Um, through you know predation and disease. By all these cats. And at least four species of snakes I like to find there. The frogs like to find there. What's your bird count at Cobbs Creek now? I'm sure it's over 100 at this point. You yeah. know. I mean, a lot of that's probably just stuff flying over, but yeah. Still. I mean, you have plenty. You have a robust, robust populations of songbirds. I mean, I remember the spring we were out there with Leo Shang doing our uh, Extreme Philly Fishing episode. I mean, spring. Maybe it was like, I forget exactly when it was. Might have been May, might have been June. Um, but I'm walking in there, and I'm along the creek hearing just like, constant solid bird song the whole time a lot of warbling vireos remember that was the bird oh, yeah, that was like asking bird. about you know we, we can't take these spaces that are natural assets and and resources for us and our neighbors and just turn them into extensions of our like backyards you know or extensions of our living rooms where our pets should be not even yeah um, oh yeah so and I also I, I came home the other night to a, another tuxedo cat that lives on my block mm-hmm. Uh, and I this saw. Is the most I come home. It was Halloween, and I love Halloween in our neighborhood. Yeah. Um, I love sitting on a stoop, and and you know sitting on the porch with Angie and giving out candy to kids. It's so fun. I love yep. it. I look forward to it so much. I come home and I see this tuxedo cat crouch, and I look down, and it has a white throated sparrow. Yeah. Not that you know house sparrow is, you know, I mean it's a house sparrow is a basic species, but it's still kind of sad if it was a house sparrow. But it's a white throated sparrow. This is a bird that sings all winter long, which is rare. Yeah. Uh, and it's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a really attractive bird. Yeah. It would it was probably bred in the, you know, as close as the Poconos, as far away as central Alaska. Yeah. You know, and and even those birds migrate east. They don't actually go down the west coast. And so this bird could have, could have come from thousands of miles away. 
and some irresponsible pet owner let their cat out and now it's dead. Yeah. And so I made a post about it. I said that and yeah, I guess did. because it was eloquent enough, a lot of people reposted it. And then I got in a whole new breed of arguments with people who... You got some weird trolls on that thread, man. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it, honestly, is uh, like we have a new climate now. And I think a lot to do with Trump where it's empowered animals. I hope it's not just because I'm in the, the circles that care about the wildlife, but I feel like I'm seeing more pushback, and hopefully that post will be that kind of thing. The main thing we wanted to talk about today, we're going to get to a grab bag of other fun topics, but the main thing we want to talk about today is the City Nature Challenge, Tony. Indeed. I'm yes. looking forward to it. So the City Nature Challenge is something that came out of 2016, basically a bet between Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and uh, the California Academy of Sciences, which is in San Francisco. It's been a long time since I've been in San Francisco, but the, the California Academy has a great like zoo slash museum with a fabulous reptile collection mm. of like Northern Californian snakes. I always love that. They do other things too, <laughs> including apparently striking up a bet between those two museums about who could do who could who could have the better bio blitz essentially. Mm. And that was 2016, and then 2017 it spread. They they invited other cities to compete. In 2018 they went international. 68 cities took part all over the globe. They had more than 17,000 people participating, 441,000 observations made of 8,600 species. And this is using mostly using iNaturalist as the platform for it. We found out about it like too late. Like I remember it was March, I learned this was happening at all, and I called Robin, who was, would be the natural person to call for this kind yeah. of thing. Maybe... Naveen will mention in a second. Um, but I called Robin and I was like, dude, like this is happening in a few weeks. Are we doing it? And he's like, no, we missed the registration. I was like, and, and I was baffled. But his group that he works for, the Tucane Tacone Frankfurt Watershed Partnership, they held their own little like bio blitz that the same time period. This is the end of April, three days at the end of April. And we resolved not to let it go past again. And so when the, the sign up period came around in September, there was a lot of like, it was a very complicated process in getting signed up. But long story short, our buddy Naveen, who's uh, active in the Delaware Valley Ornithological Club and is Philadelphia's most prolific iNaturalist contributor um, in terms of observations, he's developing a, an expertise in dragonflies and damselflies, which I find impressive. Did he, did he get eclipsed by Dan Eschelson recently, though? He was, like, way ahead of a lot of people. Dan, did Dan just do a whole ton of... Because Dan got laid off from uh, Pharma. And <laughs> so he, he's been wandering around taking pictures of Yeah, so Dan, Dan works for Pharma and makes a lot of money at Pharma. And all those jobs, like, he, I guess he's, he was so valuable. They get merged all the time, yeah. Yeah, and he, he, he lasted through, like, I don't know, five, eight mergers. And, and they finally, you know, cut his position, at, you know. And he was so fed up, he just, he hasn't worked in a year and doesn't want to and so he's just been i natural to get up like crazy so naveen possibly the top contributor maybe second but naveen signed up and so tony robin naveen and i are the organizing committee for philadelphia for city nature challenge but we just want to highlight this now you wherever you are on the globe there's not a bad chance your city is involved with this um so look it up citynaturechallenge.org you can find the list of contributing cities. I know we have listeners all over the world. For example, Tony, do you know what our, aside from the United States, our top two countries are for listeners for this podcast? Wasn't it England and Japan? Yes. You nailed it. Yeah. So, like, Canada comes in fourth, like, after, including the United States, which I'm kind of baffled by. I think we'd have more people in Canada than we'd have in Japan. They, I feel like it's like a David, Hassel, David Hasselhoff joke. Yeah, they love us in Japan. Or like a cheap trick or... Yeah. You know, or deep purple. But yeah, so we got fans in Tokyo, for example. Look it up. Um, get involved with your local city nature challenge. And even if you're not officially participating, maybe April 26th to 29th, which is the, are the dates this year, can be a time for you to go out uh, in your city and observe some nature, take some pictures on a naturalist, and share it around. Um, I think it's a great way... You know, our podcast is, is all about like turning people on to the nature that's in their cities. And this is a great way to, to, to get out there and look up stuff. iNaturalist is more fun than I give it credit. I'm a late adopter kind of guy. And so I hadn't realized the, how nice the algorithm and sort of the crowdsourcing aspect of it is. Um, so that you can not, generally not know what kind of beetle that is. Because who the hell knows all their beetles? And you take a picture of the beetle. Um, the algorithm narrows it down for you. Uh, it might even suggest a specific one. And then 
you're, you know, we're all nerds of some kind. I'm the, I'm the reptile amphibian guy who likes to go through and ID other people's pictures of toads. Somewhere out there, there's the beetle nerd who, and hopefully a couple of them who are there and will agree that what you saw is a six spotted neolima to take one that I, that I had fun with this summer. You can observe stuff without having to worry that you got it right. You know, like you can just take a guess and other people are going to help you out. Philadelphia yeah. is going to kick everyone's ass. Maybe Perhaps. not Houston because it's further south. But. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not the ideal time for us. A lot of things won't be quite leafed out yet and flower and a lot of insects aren't going to, are just starting and are going to be in like small life stages. But it should be really fun. I'm already planning a big day on the that Sunday. Yeah. I'm going to get school groups on the Friday and Monday. I'm going to go out with them. Saturday I have to work, unfortunately. But I'm going to – my my activity is to do this with – at the Fox, at Fox Chase Farm. It's a festival that day. And my activity is going to lead people on, on a natural walk. Nice. So I'm going to be doing four days straight of it. And we're, we're, we've been contacting groups all over the Philadelphia region. Um, all the count, We're doing Philadelphia and all the counties that, na- that, that neighbor Philadelphia. But a few things have popped up that like have not made it into their own podcast episodes exactly because it's just we haven't had a chance to pull them together, but they're really cool. So they love us in Japan. Here's someone in Fukuoka, um, Japan. Fukuoka, I think they say it. Fukuoka, Japan. Southern, so, southern Japan. I should yeah. never doubt Tony's knowledge of East Asian geography. And so we're watching a video of this where the boar gets kind of he- like penned in in a fence behind a building along some rail- railroad tracks. And then this unlucky commuter just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Bam! And the boar takes him down like a bowling pin and then gores him. The guy had to go to the hospital and get a lot of stitches. It's not that nothing to joke about, but it was a hell of an interaction with a boar. <laughs> That's not the kind of wildlife, urban wildlife encounter that I wish on anyone, but it, it, it is interesting that you have wild boars right in the city. It yeah. is, and there's, they're in a lot of cities. I assume they're native there. Um, they're totally native. Boars are urban in a lot of places. Berlin, most famously. We'll get to that in a second. We had an episode back in 2016 called Urban Caracals and Barcelona Boars. And that's when you can go listen to about the boars of Barcelona, Spain. So we'll say it. Everywhere from Barcelona to Japan, they got wild boars. It's kind of like having something that's maybe as heavy as a deer. I guess they're a little smaller in Japan than they are in Western Europe, but like still a decent sized animal with, re- with ra- as they always say, razor sharp tusks um, and smart, generally not too bad. I understand unless they get wounded or freaked out like this one was. I like to talk to somebody about like the um, idea that domestic pig in its own lifetime, if it gets re- released, starts morphing into boar, having like like what is it what happened does it does it does it somehow shift like it's yeah because i heard that i've heard that so like that. Mo- and that their tusk in law their their tusk in lo- enlarged i've heard nothing about this and 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 like you know it just one being released and i've heard it so often that it seems like there has to be some truth to it but i i i need to look at the literature and and find out how that how that takes place if you get really hungry you can do like this guy did in a Berlin supermarket parking lot, which our German frequent guest host, um, Christian Hunold, forwarded along on Facebook. It was in Spiegel online, and it was the headline was 80-year-old slaughters boar on supermarket parking lot. So a guy apparently <laughs> and shows the implements. Wow. <laughs> He's got a long knife and a hatchet, or I guess technically an axe. Robin corrected me on that. It was a guy who was already a butcher, so he knew how to do this. But somehow he had been feeding the boar and, like, got it close enough and then, like, stabbed it. Um, wow. And and then um, started dismembering it. And then they found him in the parking lot with his wife and, like, half of a boar carcass. <laughs> Were they, uh, did they, was it illegal? Did they charge I think him? it was illegal. It reminds me of when I was in Peru. There was this hotel, like a little motel on the side of the road where we stayed doing... When I was joining my friends for, you know, poison dart frog research, and there was a collared peccary that lived there on the grounds, and I, I would feed it Oreos and stuff, and and man, they called him Senior Chancho, and then one, <laughs> and then one, someone told me that there used to be two, and then they revved their belly. If people don't know, uh, collared peccaries are, are one of the, I think there's like three or four species of New World sewid, 
there's these, you know, these Sounds New right World thing. Pigs, which is a great name for a band, New World Pigs. Um, but I, th- suits, but yeah. yeah, but I think, uh, I think I will actually do a band called New World Vultures, which is another. I'm working on this. This band. podcast is a never-ending font of, bond, of band names. You already had g- creeping growth form. I know. That you still sure. confused. Um, then the second to last topic I wanted to bring up that I've been wanting to maybe we we'll, we still might do something about this eventually, but um, European black-bellied hamsters, um, which are uh, a different species than the ones we tend to keep as pets. We keep some dwarf hamster species as pets and Syrian hamsters as pets, which can be mean little suckers. Um, they're well known for like killing other hamsters uh, if you put too many in a cage. But apparently, the black-bellied hamster is a step and grassland species in central Western Asia into Central Europe. And in Central Europe, they've been in decline because of um, uh, mechanized like monoculture agriculture. Mm. Um, and they live in grasslands, and that's been you know been all plowed up and turned into. I guess wheat fields, cornfields, I'm not sure what. But so these guys hold on in grassy areas in cities in their range. So in Vienna, they've got them in like cemeteries and university grounds and that kind of thing. So there was a fun article in on NPR, National Public Radio, for those who don't listen to it. So we can share that as well on this episode's webpage. Um, but it was really neat. <laughs> it was A, it was neat just to think of like, hamsters being wild which of course they were at some point the guy who they interviewed for this article who's like someone that you get you who gets called in in vienna to to manage like how construction might impact specific hamster populations and his he put it they look nice and friendly but if you get too close they fight you like a bear i've got one more than tony's got one i've always wanted to talk about the fire salamanders of oviedo um, which is a city in northern Spain that got built up in, um, I guess, starting around the 800s, or maybe it was the 700s. I can't remember if it was the 8th century or the 800s. Uh, but it's a really old city. And, and if you think about a small salamander, a small animal like a fire salamander, they look a lot like the North American spotted salamanders in that they're black background, bright yellow or orange markings on the, the back that background. The, the thinking is that Um, salamander as a mythical creature that was associated with fire comes from these guys being in wood piles and so then when Mm. you throw the logs on the fire they get the hell out of the logs so they were associated with fire but they're basically salamanders like we have in North America and so a walled city would if you think of walls I mean it's not so easy for a salamander to get get through or over them but then on top of that you know there's urbanization with buildings and streets and stuff so that whatever the original habitat was like however many hundreds of years ago um, salamanders have been isolated from outside populations but then within the city populations would be like the little subpopulations would be isolated so you'd have a population that was just in this cemetery over there and then on the other side of town you might have a church courtyard where there's some more salamanders um, and so on uh, where they where they were relatively cut off from each other. There was some research done into them recently. Uh, the paper came out called Trapped Within the City, Integrating Demography, Time Sense Isolation, and Population-Specific Traits to Assess the Genetic Effects of Urbanization by Lorenzo, Alvarez, Wang, and Velo Anton. And this was in uh, Molecular Ecology, 2017. I can't say I followed everything. <laughs> Um, they're looking at various like analyses of the genetic material from the salamanders, um, and there's showing that yeah, those little these little urban populations are differentiated. They're like they're definitely distinct little populations, but um, there was, from what I understand, somewhat confusing re- or, or results they weren't entirely expecting, showing how how inbred they would be. To put it in my layman's terms, maybe I'm getting, I'm getting this wrong. I remember interviewing somebody for the turtle episode. I don't think this made it into the episode, but we're talking about how in some kinds of, um, he was mentioning some kinds of amphibians, you see less inbreeding than you would expect, Hmm. or less, that's the wrong way to put it, um, that you see less negative effects of what we would call inbreeding, where, you know, you have relatively close related animals breeding with close related animals because all they got, um, that with some of these kinds of amphibians, some amphibians, you see this happening you see the inbreeding, to use the lamest term for it, happening 
um, but you don't see them having a you don't see it causing major problems in those little subpopulations. Now, I'm just sort of remembering this from a conversation that was really about something else. Um, but that sort of popped in my head when I read this article about the fire salamanders. So something to check out. And now, Tony, you had one last thing for a grab bag. Well, the um, the famous Singapore otters, have you seen this? They're, they're adorable. Yeah. yeah the B, uh, the Bishan otter family in Marina Bay, Singapore, they're uh, smooth-coated otters. So a British couple was there, and they went to uh um there was a proposal and the otters were like there for the proposal like in the pictures of of this guy proposing to his fiance and the otters are there and so i just really this is love that there's a a place because you know i i've been in that part of the world and like i've seen like otter crap on like boardwalks or whatever and like you know otters are tough you know to see uh, often it's strange like you know, Billy and I are in the woods all the time, and we live in, you know, there's otters in here, and there's a population. We see them on camera. Like, yeah. the fish cam at the Fairmont Dam. And sees they, the yeah, they're in Philadelphia. We have friends that yeah. have photographed them. And even last week, there was some in, in, in Philly at the at John Hines. And that was a big deal that someone photographed them. Yeah, and I've seen them in the Pine Barrens um, once. I've seen them in Cape May once. I've seen them in Florida, and I've seen them in Vancouver, and that they're urban otters in Vancouver too. They're right in the harbor, there. So I mean, we do have. I mean, there's the videos of those otters playing with a golden retriever. So there are populations of urban otters in marinas in in the states in Canada, but it's interesting how how it happens. Where like otters are notoriously like hard to see. You know, I've except for of course giant otters when I'm down in Brazil. They're if you go where they are, they're if you're on a boat they're pretty easy to see but the otters that we live near that are all around us yeah we hardly ever actually see right and i've not seen i've been i mean there's otters almost everywhere in the world that you go and i rarely see otters you know and and uh it's unbelievable how like just certain populations become urbanized and tame and, and some and don't we're looking at a picture of this guy on his knees with his fiance standing there next to him you know Looking at the ring, and there's one, two, three, four, or five otters. <laughs> they kind of frolicking yeah. in the foreground. These are pretty s- small otters. Our river otters. I mean, they're not giant otter size, but river otters are. They're pretty big. They're they like, make it look like they're, they're the audience. They're like kind of looking at them. Yeah, this is awesome. Really awesome. So I need to. I mean, I've been to Singapore twice, but I just this phenomenon was there. The one thing that was cool there when I was in Singapore, I saw it both times I was there. There's a a crocodile, a saltwater croc that hung out in this. Um, park, um, Singebulo, I think you call it. It's one of the finest, like, little parks. It's this, you know, mangrove swamp, like some impoundments, like some canals. And the interpretation there, the the, the center is fin- first class. I mean, it's what you expect from Singapore, like all these different bird blinds and, and, like, you know, walls with, like, holes you can look through. And this beautiful visitor center with, like, fountains. And it was phenomenal. And there was um, um, this crocodile took up residence there and I saw it both times I was there. No way that was dangerous to anybody? You know how it is. You know, the the dikes and the boardwalks you walk on, they're much above yeah. the water. Okay. Be, you know, it'd be like going to like the Everglades, you know, yeah, where like yeah, you're yeah. not gonna get eaten by it. Or like the canals in Florida where you're really looking down on I I get I Yeah. Get, here I am the reptile guy getting nervous about a saltwater crocodile. Yeah. I was much more nervous in Australia where like we're we're camping like on a river and the guy's like, stay on this side of the road, up to the other one, the crocs are can't get to you over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? No, I'm. Um, we're good. I'm looking. I look. For, I'm looking forward to uh, the podcast studio. I'm, lo- I'm looking. For, and uh, with that, there's going to be. I personally am going to expand a little bit. I don't know if Philly wants to get on this a little bit, but I want to start doing like an, another companion show to this. That's more general wildlife around the world, not just uh, urban wildlife. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking, uh, I have a, a little mirrorless camera, um, Sony, you know, Alpha 500 yeah. or 5000. I'm looking to do a little bit of some video. Maybe we'll do, you know, I'd like to start, you know, traveling and, uh, you know, I'd love to go to Miami and see those guys down there and like snorkel or scuba dive on the, on the coral in the Miami Harbor. I, I mean, want to, I want to start going and doing video. This is of, the problem with the podcast is that like you end up talking about so many cool things around the world. You, you want to go see them all. Yeah, and go take, yeah. go shoot some video of it, you know? Yeah. Um, thank you again for listening to another episode of the Urban Wildlife Podcast. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at urbanwildlifecast at gmail.com. 
You can find us on Twitter at Herb Wildlife Cast, and you can find our Facebook page also, where you can leave us some comments and get involved that way. Um, we're always looking for more ideas, and um, we welcome content from listeners. We have done things in the past like um, have a listener interview someone he thought would be good for the podcast. We're like, sure, go ahead and interview him. We'll put it on the podcast. That was great. Um, about urban uh, rattlesnakes in particular. And then we, um, we also love to interview you guys out there. Um, even if you don't think that you yourself are, maybe you are who's someone who's doing like academic research or is in, involved in some kind of official conservation capacity, great, we want to talk to you if it's about urban wildlife. But maybe you're someone who's a lay enthusiast and still knows a ton about something in particular in your home. Um, maybe you do, you're not an ornithologist, but you know you know a lot about the. You, maybe you know a lot about the kestrels that are living in your neighborhood in Vienna. You know, and this is something that you observe all the time and you pay a lot of attention to. Again, maybe you're not an ornithologist, but we still think you would be the a valuable contributor to the podcast. You know, get in touch. We'd love to talk to you. Um, and what's our catchy phrase? Until next time, watch well, we, birds every day, <laughs> herp every day, lep every day. Until, just the, get, until the next episode. <laughs> yeah, just enjoy yourselves in the in the in the wilds of your home, in the in in the wilds of wilderness. Just get out there, and enjoy yourselves.